Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. Uh, this is another video in the series covering financial planning for business owners. And in this video, and this is really part one of a two-part uh, mini series, let's say again, and we're going to deal with the capital dividend account and then capital dividends. Uh, it's a fairly in-depth concept, so best to spread it over two videos. And certainly tons of relevance here for the financial advisor. The capital dividend account is a notional flow through account. It's only available to private corporations. Publicly traded companies do not have this. It allows a tax free capital dividend to be paid to a shareholder or shareholders. It is a notional account. Uh, which is a way of saying that it's an account where there's not actually a bank account attached to it. Think of it the same way as your RRSP deduction limit. I file my taxes every year. I get a notice of assessment. My notice of assessment might say that I have $15,000 of RRSP deduction limit. That does not mean that I actually have $15,000 to put into my RRSP. Well, similarly, you may have a CDA account credit available but it doesn't mean you have that money available to pay out as a capital dividend. And this is generated by the non-taxable portion of your uh, capital gains. It's reduced though by the non-allowable portion of capital losses. I have a little example of this that we'll go through on the next slide, which should help with that. But basically that means capital gains and losses within the corporation create a capital dividend account or reduce a capital dividend account credit. And a life insurance death benefit, these are really the two core ways to generate a CDA credit. There are a bunch of other rules, but they all basically come down to these two things. Either you have to have had a capital gain at some point or a life insurance policy that paid a benefit into the corporation. Even when that happens, that's only a benefit in excess of the ACB of that policy. Now, life insurance is the only way to do this, not critical illness insurance, not CI with return of premium, not an accidental death and dismemberment policy, only a life insurance policy where the benefit pays into the corporation. And using the connected companies rules, we can actually transfer a CDA credit from OPCO to HOLDCO. Let's see how this works with a capital gain. With the Trashco then, let's say for the sake of argument that Trashco had a capital loss resulting from the sale of land at a loss in uh, 2020. So they had bought some land, planning to use it, but uh, something went wrong and it turns out they had to sell it at a loss. They took a $40,000 capital loss or a $20,000 allowable capital loss. Now, in reality, that doesn't actually have an immediate impact on their CDA credit. There's nothing there that actually bothers them yet. But a couple of years down the road, let's say they've invested $100,000 in mutual funds, redeemed it, made a $100,000 gain. That's a $50,000 taxable capital gain. Or looking at it differently, there's $50,000 out of that capital gain that is not taxable then Trashco will have a $20,000 negative CDA credit. Now you really don't have a negative CDA credit. It doesn't get calculated that way until you try to have a, let's say a positive CDA credit. So you don't actually necessarily see this until it comes time to take advantage of the capital gain that we see in the next step. When we get that capital gain in Trashco, then Trashco's accountant, and we'll talk about this more in the next presentation, but uh, we're gonna rely on Norman here and Norman looks at the history of Trashco and capital gains and losses and says, all right, we had a $20,000 negative CDA credit associated with this capital loss, and then we had a $50,000 positive CDA credit associated with this capital gain. The net here is that there is a $30,000 uh, CDA credit available. We'll talk more in the next presentation about how to deal with that CDA credit once it's available, but in the short term, we know that that means there's up to $30,000 available for uh, Trashco to pay out as a tax-free capital dividend. Doesn't necessarily mean it has that cash, but it means it has the opportunity to do that, assuming that it 
has some way to actually make that happen. Now, a little bit of a twist here that people don't always think about with the uh, capital dividend account and donations of publicly traded securities. I had mentioned that it's the tax-free portion of a capital gain that creates a credit to the capital dividend account. Technically, the tax-free portion of the capital gain associated with a donation is the entire capital gain. It's actually not necessarily true that the capital gain associated with the donation of publicly traded securities is tax-free. What's more accurate is that it's a 0% inclusion rate, meaning none of that income or none of that gain is brought into income. And we see that here. Trashco invests $110,000 in a mutual fund. It grows to 210. Now Trashco donates the mutual fund in kind to a registered charity, provides a receipt for $210,000. So Trashco will be able to use that uh, receipt to offset $210,000 of income. And then Trashco itself has a $100,000 capital gain, apply a 0% inclusion rate, that's zero taxable capital gain. It means that the non-taxable portion of the capital gain is the full $100,000. The CDA credit then associated with this donation is $100,000. If Trashco has the cash on hand, again, it can pass up to $100,000 tax-free to its shareholders. It's quite an attractive measure, and it provides a good reason to make donations out of a charity, although, again, we should always be relying on our accountant to run the numbers. Sometimes it can make more sense to make the donation personally to have the charity actually redeem the asset, pay the cash out to the shareholder and have the shareholder make the donation because a charity only gets to deduct its donations, whereas a shareholder is going to get a tax credit that's normally somewhere around 50%. It's up to the accountant again to run the numbers and see what's actually more beneficial. What about life insurance then? Trashco has a $250,000 life insurance policy on a key person. Now let's assume here that this is a term insurance policy, meaning that it has no ACB or at least effectively no ACB. Term insurance technically has a really small ACB in most cases, but we'll assume just a zero ACB here. The $250,000 life insurance on this key person, key person dies. We've got $250,000 that's available then to Trashco. That's the point of the life insurance policy. Trashco burns through that $250,000, financing whatever costs they have associated with the loss of the key person, but also Trashco has a $250,000 CDA credit. Again, that's based on the death benefit which is $250,000 minus the ACB. In this case, the ACB is zero. The full $250,000 then all creates CDA credit. You'll normally only see substantial ACBs when life insurance is permanent with cash values. So you'll probably only see a real meaningful ACB on a UL or par whole life contract maybe a little bit on a non-par whole life just because of how ECB is calculated. If uh, Trashco then covers off all these expenses, recovers from the loss of the key person, and at some point down the road has the CDA credit available, now it can kick out that capital dividend to its shareholders on a tax-free basis. We'll talk more about that in the next presentation. I hope that helps. I hope that's a good overview of the capital dividend account credit, and I hope you enjoy your continued studies. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion around financial planning for business owners. We are on video number 19. This video is going to cover adjusted cost base and paid up capital for investments in a small business corporation. Not that that's a necessary distinction here, but that's the type of business we're looking at. Just a quick summary before we look at the example here. We have 
ACB then. I think everybody will be familiar with ACB. This is your tax base for the shares you own. And generally, there's not an easy way for shareholders to get their ACB back out of the business. There are some steps that a, a clever tax professional can take to recover some ACB in some cases, but those are fairly complex transactions. The business doesn't owe the ACB then to the shareholders. Really, the ACB of shares that I own, that's just my business. It's not a corporate matter. There's no relationship back to the corporation here. Paid up capital is a little bit different. Your paid up capital is your contributions of capital by shareholders into the business. And this is actually an amount that you can take back. This represents your capital that you can withdraw back out of the business. Now you may not be allowed to withdraw it. This would be done at the discretion of the board of directors or in accordance with any terms established in the unanimous shareholders agreement. This amount will show up actually on the corporate balance sheet. And when we say that one of the rights of shareholders includes an equity position, that's part of what that equity position refers to. To work through this, Lynn, let's introduce Darren. So Darren is actually going to buy his way into Trash Co. Now, I don't know why he wants to do this. It doesn't matter a whole lot. For the sake of simplicity, I've removed Opco, or sorry, uh, Hold Co here. There's not really a need to have Trash Co and Hold Co to illustrate this example. If there was Hold Co in here, it really wouldn't change much materially. So now, or oh, the other change, sorry, is that uh, we've gotten rid of Allen's one class C share. You might remember that Allen had taken back a class C share as part of putting his uh, old truck into the corporation. That's now been redeemed. We just have a clean ownership stake, 33% each, 300 class A shares. And I've said here, trash goes worth $3 million. That is entirely a matter of negotiation. If we were dealing in a non-arm's length transaction, that is if Darren were a family member to any of Alan, Bruce, or Connie, then we might have to establish fair market value based on some income tax principles. But given that Darren is not dealing with Alan, Bruce, or Connie uh, at anything other than arm's length, that is he is at arm's length to them, we can strictly negotiate the price for these shares and. CRA will be perfectly fine with that. CRA would say that Darren, Alan, Bruce, and Connie are all dealing on sort of level footing. There's not any sort of reason that they would uh, discount Darren the price other than just for purely commercial reasons. So they negotiate and they arrive at a price of $3 million. And if there are 300 shares, that means each share is worth $10,000 or each of Alan, Bruce, and Connie now own a million dollars worth of shares of Trash Co., which has obviously experienced some success since it was founded. Based on that, they strike a deal that Darren will pay each of Alan, Bruce, and Connie $100,000 to acquire 10 of their shares. And we're going to end up like this. Now, what would have happened here is Alan would have had, he would have brought in $100,000. And that $100,000 would have been a capital gain. And ditto for Bruce and Connie, they would all have a $100,000 capital gain, but on their remaining shares now, they still have no ACB. They would have dealt with the disposition of the shares accordingly. Their situation is unchanged from a tax perspective, except that now they own fewer shares. Each of them only owns 90 shares. Each of them sold 10 shares to Darren. Darren now has an ACB of $300,000 associated with his shares, the shares that he's acquired from Alan, Bruce, and Connie, 
of Trashco. And now Darren's in a minority shareholder position, but he is a shareholder. He owns now 10% of the shares, 30 out of an issued number of 300 shares. But there's still no puck, no paid up capital in Trashco. As part of this deal though, Alan, Bruce, Connie, and Darren all agreed that part of what Darren would do is to inject some capital into Trashco. This is going to presumably increase the value of Trashco. Maybe it allows Trashco to acquire some other asset or a competitor, something like that. And there's some value here in injecting some capital straight into Trashco. Let's have a look at now Darren's acquisition of shares or sorry, Darren's acquisition of an interest in Trashco. So now what Darren does, he adds another $500,000 into Trashco. He now has, Trashco now has a $500,000 puck based on Darren's injected capital. Now, in exchange for that, obviously Darren's going to want something. And if I were Darren, I would want to end up in an equal position to Alan, Bruce and Connie. Who knows if that's possible? What keeps the share value the same and makes our example easier to follow is that Darren adds another 50 shares from Treasury and now owns 80 shares. And he just injected another $500,000 here. So he would have now an ACB of $800,000 based on having injected that much of his after-tax capital into Trashco. Now, I have no idea why Darren did this in particular, if he wants to participate in future growth or if he thinks it's an exciting venture and he figures this is a, a good small business to invest in, whatever it happens to be, we've now brought Darren on board. Now, this $500,000 of puck, this is actually going to show up on Trashco's balance sheet. And it will be owned proportionately by the four shareholders. So at this point now we have uh, 320 shares. So you can basically allocate the puck accordingly. If we've got $500,000 of puck, and 320 shares, that means basically each share has a right to $1,563 or $1,562.50 of puck. Now, most likely we don't touch that until something happens that causes a, a breakup of the company or until one of the shareholders dies. We're going to see that much later in this set of presentations. But fundamentally, uh, that puck is owned by or is allocated to each share. And with all of them having class A shares, well, there's fairly uh, distributed ownership of that puck across the now four shareholders of Trashco. And now we've uh, brought Darren into the mix, although he's got a little bit lower ownership stake than Alan, Bruce, and Connie. He's still along for the ride, and he did have to invest some of his capital. And again, that's entirely a negotiated process. I guess Alan, Bruce, and Connie feel that their value to the business or that they've contributed about $800,000 of their sweat equity, we might call it, to the business. And that's why they asked Darren to kick in that $800,000 so that he's sort of roughly on equal ground or slightly less than equal ground with his less than 90 shares. I hope that makes sense. And you can see then that the ACB is unique to each shareholder while the puck is shared across the class of shares to which it's attached. I hope you enjoy your continued studies. Thank you very much. Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series, uh, continuing the series dealing with business owners and financial planning for those business owners. In this video, we're going to finish out our discussion around capital dividends. We're going to look through a little more complicated example of a capital dividend account at work. 
So again, just a quick reminder here, only available to private corporations. It's a notional account and generated by either the non-taxable portion of capital gains or a death benefit from a life insurance policy. And that's what we're going to see in this example. So in this particular example, we have, and this kind of follows through from the example we used in the last presentation. We'll go a little bit more into depth here. So we're a ways down the road with uh, Trash Co. now. Let's assume that uh, Alan and Bruce and Connie have decided to hire on an operations manager in Trash Co. They hire on Vanessa as their operations manager. And James is their advisor. He's staying on top of things. He knows what's going on here. James says, folks, uh, have you considered the risk here associated with the loss of Vanessa? And Vanessa's in a fairly senior role. Maybe they have her uh, with some profit sharing, for example. And so James says, folks, why don't you look at putting in place some life insurance on her life, just a little life insurance policy, maybe a $250,000 term insurance policy on Vanessa's life. And this is sort of based on a uh, needs analysis that they will do working hand in hand with James here. They say, what would it cost you to lose her? What would it cost to hire a replacement? What's the lost revenues for the business? What would it cost to outsource this job? All those types of things. And they hammer all this out. They settle on a quarter million dollars or thereabouts. And that works nicely as far as what James can do for a life insurance policy for them. They can't deduct, deduct their premiums or anything like that. They're going to uh, pay their premiums with their after-tax dollars. And they probably will own this policy in Holdco. So they'll pay their premiums with Holdco's after-tax dollars. And they might have Holdco as beneficiary, but it's likely that Trashco is the beneficiary and that's perfectly fine. We can go down the corporate ladder that way. We generally can't go up the corporate ladder. So Holdco is the owner and Trashco is the uh, beneficiary of this policy. That's a fairly standard way to do this. It allows us to have the policy owned in a place where it's less exposed to a possible uh, claim by creditors and it allows the benefit to be paid where the cash is actually needed. Now, because it's a life insurance story and it's one of my stories, obviously Vanessa's got to die. Sorry, Vanessa. So uh, Vanessa dies. And when that happens, there's $250,000 paid to Trashco. And Trashco subsequently uses that money. Trashco burns through it relatively quickly. So Trashco uses that money to deal with their loss of Vanessa. And hopefully that there is proper life insurance in place personally on Vanessa to help her family deal with the losses. It's possible that there's some group insurance in place here. Uh, maybe even Trashco has a policy that says we pay up to the $10,000 tax-free death benefit that's allowed on the death of an employee. That's still something that we can do. Now the cash is all gone, but when the death benefit is paid to Trashco, uh, then Trashco has a $250,000 CDA credit, again, assuming a zero ACB for the policy. Now, Trashco can't really use the CDA credit. It doesn't have personal shareholders. We're going to uh, consult with Norman here, and Norman says, all right, pretty easy. We're actually just going to uh, transfer the CDA credit from Trashco to Holdco. And now Holdco has that $250,000 CDA credit available. Now the question is what to do with it. Now you might notice, you probably have noticed that I introduced a little bit of a twist here just for the sake of this presentation, that's it. We might do this again later, but for now, just for the sake of this presentation, uh, Bruce is an American. He is a US person for 
tax purposes. And this creates a little bit of complexity here. What we could do with this $250,000, now let's assume that uh, just for the sake of argument, Holdco has some cash. Holdco has, let's say, $200,000 of cash on hand. Just for the sake of argument, what we could do here is take some of that cash on hand. We could pay it out, pay uh, $67,000 each or 66, 667 to Alan, Bruce, and Connie. That would be tax-free to Alan and tax-free to Connie, but Bruce, as an American, actually is subject to different tax treatment here. Because of his US person tax status, the Americans will actually tax this dividend in Bruce's hands. So we have to figure out how to do this without creating a double taxation outcome or creating a, an adverse tax outcome. Here's what I would suggest, I think working with Norman on this, so James, Norman, Alan, Bruce, Connie would all sit down. And here's what I think they would probably arrive at, although there are some other possible options here, but uh, they might agree to pay a dividend to each of them. But Bruce says, look, that tax-free dividend's kind of wasted on me. Now, honestly, as a shareholder of a corporation who is a US person, Bruce is going to create all kinds of other complications here for the corporation. That's something that I don't really want to get into here, but it's probably a reason alone to really consider how we structure things as far as Holdco as an investor, what types of assets Holdco has. This is a, a nightmarish tax problem for Bruce, and this is probably the least of our worries, but we'll deal with it anyways. So here's what happens. We say, we're gonna pay uh, $66,667 uh, tax-free to Allen. That's gonna come from Holdco. We're gonna pay $67,667 tax-free to Connie. That's going to come from Holdco again. And then we're going to pay $66,667, sorry, $66,667 as a taxable dividend, probably a non-eligible dividend to Bruce. That's the $200,000 of cash all gone. And what we've probably done here is optimize the CDA credit. Now, Bruce might want something else to kind of sweeten the pot a little bit, and they could potentially, uh, depending on how their share classes are set up, might pay Bruce a different amount, or they might end up uh, maybe paying him a little bit of a bonus, something like that. There might be some way to uh, smooth that out. What's happened now is we have used a chunk of that CDA credit. We've used 133333 or $334 of the CDA credit, which means there's still a, a good chunk of it left. Now there's no cash left in Holdco, but now we do still have $116,666 of unused CDA credits. And this is where this gets a little bit messy because what you would generally like to do is to get those capital dividend account credits out right away. Oh, I will point out here, sorry, I've got Norman on the slide here. And one of the keys here is that we don't do this until Norman has filed the T2054 on behalf of the corporation. If the T2054 hasn't been filed, then we run into a penalty tax, which I'll show on the next slide. It's quite prohibitive, excuse me. So we have to make sure that Norman properly addresses this. Okay, so then we've got $116,666 of unused CDA credits. What we probably will do at this point is just wait until Holdco has some more cash on hand. then pay out our tax-free capital dividends. Now there's some risk with that. 
because if the circumstances change substantially for Holdco, it might not have the capital dividend account credit available anymore if, for example, it gets acquired by a publicly traded company or partly acquired by a publicly traded company, then it's no longer a private corporation and that would wreck that CDA credit. What you would generally prefer to do for this reason, if you can pull it off, and this is going to be a little bit of a challenge, but we might consider paying a promissory note that is creating an IOU and pay that as a dividend in kind to each of Alan, Bruce, and Connie. And when we do that, then we basically have that taxed as a tax-free capital dividend to Alan and Connie and as a taxable dividend to Bruce. That will put them in a situation where Holdco owes them that money And then later on, they can collect that debt tax-free. Again, not a great deal for Bruce. We're going to have to find some way to sweeten the pot for Bruce to make this up to him. But we can see that the ability to use that capital dividend account credit is quite attractive here. I hope that that helps. And I hope you can see that there's some management required with this. Even where you don't have a US person as a shareholder, this can still be quite uh, complicated. Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. Uh, this video continues our series dealing with uh, financial planning for business owners. In this set of videos, and it's going to be the first of a four part series, we're going to be looking at the lifetime capital gains exemption. This will be the 20th video in the series, and this entire series will comprise, or this mini series will comprise videos 20 through 23. We'll deal with four separate topics here. Uh, this video will deal with an introduction to the lifetime capital gains exemption. Uh, the next will deal with the limitations and farming and fishing definitions. And then the last two videos will deal with purification and crystallizing, which are uh, concepts where we are sometimes, I wish to maybe take it a step further with lifetime capital gains exemption. Okay, what happens then? Lifetime capital gains exemption gives somebody who, a person, this has to be a person, although it can apply to trusts as well, to personal trusts. So a person or a personal trust selling shares of a qualified small business corporation or qualified farm property or qualified fishing property. And technically in the Income Tax Act, qualified farming property and fishing property are bundled together, but I think it's generally clearer to separate them out. And a gain on that property then, if it's QSBC shares, and we'll talk a little bit more about what defines uh, the qualifying, sorry, qualified small business corporation here in a couple of slides, but with QSBC shares, it's an $848,252 exemption. And that amount is indexed to inflation. As the legislation is written right now, that will cap out at a million dollars. Uh, personally, I will be surprised if nothing changes between now and when that exemption gets to a million, whether it's that we see another increase in the available uh, lifetime capital gains exemption, or whether some government dispatches with this thing altogether. Whatever happens, happens, but I'd be surprised if it stays the same. Uh, farming and fishing property, a million dollars of capital gains exemption here, no indexing, there's no need for it. Basically, it's already capped out like that. We'll have a look at a scenario where we have our three founders plus Darren, our acquirer, and they're all going to get an offer to sell their business or to buy their business. Somebody comes in and says, I want to buy the shares of Trash Co. complete. So I wanna buy the, the shares here, and this is very important, um, for $6 million. And if we break out those valuations then, just a quick bit of math, we can see that each of our original founders would be selling their shares for $1.8 million and Darren would be selling his shares for $600,000. The one significant difference here 
is that our three founders have no ACB, so this would be a $1.8 million capital gain for each of them three times, then we'd have a, that $1.8 million capital gain. Whereas Darren, you might recall, invested $300,000 of his own money. That was that paid up capital we talked about earlier. And he just has a $300,000 capital gain. And we'll assume here that the paid up capital or puck that Darren put into the business here has been extracted at some point. So there's no more paid up capital in the business. That's all come out. Okay, so we have three capital gains of $1.8 million for each of Alan, Bruce, and Connie, and then Darren has a $300,000 capital gain. I hope that makes sense. We're going to see how the lifetime capital gains exemption would treat each of them in this potential sale of this business. And of course, this is a good opportunity for James to get involved here because this is a big cash injection for each of Alan, Bruce, and Connie, and Darren as well. We'd want to think about what they're going to do with the money. Are they going to move on to another venture? Are they going to go back into the workforce? Are they going to retire? Are they going to invest this? Are they going to use it to buy another business, to buy real estate, whatever it is? This is a classic example of where uh, James should be involved. And I would suggest James's role here should primarily not be a tax role, but really an advisory role dealing with the allocation of funds uh, we'll see that we're going to have to involve uh, Norman quite a bit here. Our accountant becomes a very important resource in a transaction like this. I'm sure you can appreciate why that would be. Now, the question that we're going to bring Norman in on here, and likely James would be involved in this as well, is can the owners of Trash Co. actually qualify for the lifetime capital gains exemption here? The rules hold that... They must be selling shares of a qualified small business corporation, which they are based on the following definitions. It is a Canadian controlled private corporation. We've previously discussed that. The shares or the underlying assets have been owned by the seller or sellers in this case for the prior 24 months. Let's assume that it's been more than 24 months since Darren came in. And then we know it's 24 months for the rest of them and that can be owned by the seller or their spouse. There's a little bit of a, a provision here for a spouse as well. 50% uh, or more of the assets of the corporation and any connected corporations. You have to take into account any OPCO hold cost structure. Now they don't have an OPCO hold cost structure as things stand right now, so that's not a problem, but you have to look at the entire OPCO hold cost structure and we have to make sure that everything was Principally, that means 90% or more being actively used for the prior 24 months. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about purification in the fourth video in this series. And 90% or more at the time of sale. Again, this will be a key concept when we look at purification later on. Basically, these rules are designed to make sure that it is an active corporation that is carrying on business in Canada. Norman looks at the fact pattern here and says, yeah, it looks good to go. Looks like we should be able to use this. If it's a more complicated scenario, we might need to bring a tax lawyer in, but Norman is fairly confident here. There's nothing too unusual with uh, Trash Co. Norman says, yeah, if you take that deal, you'll be able to qualify. Now, what would this look like? We're going to assume that this goes ahead and I wanna show how this looks on the tax return because understanding how this looks on the tax return can help to understand a little bit of the underlying uh, math or the underlying numbers here. What it actually is called in the Income Tax Act is the capital gains deduction. You won't find reference in the Income Tax Act to the capital gains exemption or the lifetime capital gains exemption. It's properly the capital gains deduction. The way this works, it shows up then on your tax return with the essentially the 50% inclusion rate applied. So the 2018 exemption is 200, sorry, is $848,252. That actually represents a tax deduction of half that amount. $424,126, that's the amount you would see reported on your 
line 254. That's actually the amount that would show up on your tax return. The 848.252 is basically just that amount times two. It's almost a notional amount. We really just think about that because we normally talk about capital gains and not taxable capital gains. Uh, the taxable capital gain then would show up at line 127. So for each of these three folks, they have a, oh, I got a typo in there, a weird typo, sorry about that. They have a $1.8 million uh, capital gain on disposition of their uh, QSBC shares. That's a uh, $1,800,000 capital gain. They would show 900,000 of taxable capital gains on line 127. And then they would show the deduction amount of 424, 126 on line 254. They would have taxable income of 475, 874 as a result. This would be just the same as if we took the $1.8 million, the full amount of capital gain minus the full amount of exemption minus $848,252. If we subtracted those two amounts out, we would see that that comes to $951,748. And then if we applied the 50% inclusion rate, the normal 50% inclusion rate for a capital gain here, we're going to get $475,874. It's the same outcome. It's just how we got there that's a little bit different. I hope that does make sense. I know sometimes people find that a little bit of a challenging concept. But you do have to, when you're thinking about capital gains, consider both the capital gain and the taxable capital gain, which is essentially what we're doing here. For Darren, this is going to be a little bit different because Darren only has a $300,000 capital gain and we would take 300,000 times 50%, he would show $150,000 taxable capital gain, and he would show then $150,000 of deduction. He can't take more deduction than the amount of taxable capital gain that he's reporting, that wouldn't make any sense. So he only has, as a result, no taxable income. He's been able to wipe it all out. Now, what does this mean for them down the road? Well. For Alan, Bruce, and Connie, they've used their full amount of capital gains exemption. They, they don't have any access to it. However, the amount is indexed, and this is not reality. I don't know what this number is going to be yet, but let's just say for the sake of argument that inflation is 2%. That would push the exemption up to $865,217 in 2019, and that would actually, that increased amount becomes available to Alan, Bruce, and Connie. So each of them would have just a little bit of lifetime capital gains exemption available starting in 2019. And then in 2020, they would have a little bit more and 2021, just a little bit more than that. So they start, they would start to build that up again, slowly. Uh, Darren, on the other hand, uh, he's only used $300,000 of his exemption. He would still have $548,242 of exemption remaining plus whatever future indexing applies. I hope that helps to get us started with the lifetime capital gains exemption. We've really just scratched the surface. There are many, many more rules available with this, uh, this generous tax provision, but you'll see that it gets actually very challenging to use it. Uh, scenarios like the one I've described here where Alan, Bruce, and Connie can actually use their exemption are not all that uh, common in reality in sort of small business sales. So I hope you're following along so far. Um, we have three more videos and this concept is going to come up again in some of the later videos as well. Thank you very much and enjoy your continued studies. And welcome back to the Business Career College video series uh, covering financial planning for business owners. Uh, we're still working through our lifetime capital gains exemption video. This will be video number 21 in the series dealing with the lifetime capital gains exemption uh, limitations as well. I had to sneak it in here somewhere to define farming and fishing property. So the lifetime capital gains exemption, it's a great benefit, 
but um, it can be very difficult to use. In fact, when I'm teaching this, I often caution people that you can learn about it, but you're going to spend more time learning about it probably than you will spend actually using it in real life. It is very difficult to use it in real life. And some of the scenarios that uh, present themselves here would be when a holding company is put in place. Well, if I have my shares of a holding company and then my holding company owns my operating company, it would be very normal that somebody doesn't want to buy the holding company. They might want to buy the operating company, but even that we'll talk about in a second might not be that common. If that happens, it's actually the holding company selling shares and the holding company is not a person and does not have access to lifetime capital gains exemption. So having that hold cost structure in place can be limiting. Uh, and we will deal with that a little bit later on. We'll deal with that when we talk about uh, purification and crystallizing the lifetime capital gains exemption. In reality, buyers almost always prefer to buy assets rather than shares. And that's because you're not buying legal liabilities or tax liabilities when you buy assets, which you are buying when you buy shares. And asset sales will not qualify for the lifetime capital gains exemption. And then a lot of times a corporation becomes a sort of victim of its own success where it started to accumulate a bunch of passive assets, whether that's real estate and most real estate in most circumstances is probably passive. Investments and cash surrender value of a life insurance policy will always be passive. And you can have a little bit of cash, but beyond what's needed for operations, that will also be considered a passive asset. The reality is that the lifetime capital gains exemption is not going to be terribly easy to use. And when you look at how businesses are actually set up, and especially once they've started to achieve some success, you're going to see that they often put themselves offside for it just by virtue of how they grow. Now, we'll take a look at farming property, and this is actually a place where you'll see the lifetime capital gains exemption used a lot. This is a very common place to see um, lifetime capital gains exemption. So it doesn't have to be incorporated. It can be an unincorporated farm, or it can be a family farming corporation, or it can be a family farm partnership or a trust. Often we see this used with sales of farm land, where it's actually the land being sold. That unincorporated farmland sale works perfectly fine in most cases. The farm has to be actively farmed. And the active farming rules are very complicated. You're gonna see a touch of this in a moment here. We absolutely 100% need good tax advice to navigate these rules. There are many twists and turns available here. Uh, this must have been actively farmed for at least 24 months. Um, in most cases, it must be actively farmed for at least 50% of the entire period owned. And actually, curiously, the instigator of this video series, I recently had the play, uh, Jim Sullivan um, out in uh, Atlantic Canada, I recently had the pleasure of sitting with a presentation he gave where he showed a very sort of convoluted um, outcome where a farm had been owned in the family for some decades, and there was sort of a mix of different ownership, and it just goes to show that it's not always the outcome you expect as far as access to lifetime capital gains exemption. Um, generally speaking, uh, crop sharing and leasing arrangements are offside here. Those are probably going to wreck this, although uh, it is possible across generations to track this sort of active and passive balance. And sometimes you can look at what parents or grandparents did with the farm to determine what the kids can do as far as their access to the lifetime capital gains exemption. I don't want to delve into the entire set of rules here. Honestly, it's far too complex and we do need to have this uh, navigated by the accountant. Every circumstance is going to be a little bit different. A fishing property is typically going to be a little bit less complicated here. You're probably only with fishing property dealing with uh, production quotas or rights. Sometimes you might have a big successful fishing corporation, but generally speaking, it's uh, quotas or rights that are going to be sold. Again, it has to be active fishing property. And again, it does not have to be incorporated. 
again, you'd want to lean on the accountant fairly heavily here. And we can see then that with fishing and farming, we have to rely on the accountant. Now we're going to look at some traps that arise or some concerns that arise when using the capital gains exemption. One very common one deals with the alternative minimum tax. This actually arises often in farming transactions, but it can happen on QSBC share sales as well. So on the left side here, I have Alan's sort of real tax calculation. This is what he would show on his tax return, and this is what I think we would expect. I've just isolated out federal tax here. I've ignored provincial tax. There would be provincial tax on top of this, but let's just leave it like this. So that's the real tax. Alan has a very low tax bill, only $2,100. But the government says, okay, we're happy to give Alan this big tax break. And this is a common feature of tax systems in most of the Western world. So we say, yeah, we're happy to give Alan this big tax break, but hang on a second here. What we don't want is Alan sort of skipping the country with all this uh, sweet tax paid money in his pocket. We want him to stick around and have some taxable income in Canada. We want him to use some of these uh, great tax savings to spur the Canadian economy. Now, I did, uh, sorry, I should have pointed this out. I did this with just a $900,000 capital gain, not the 1.8 million we had previously calculated. At 1.8, this would not have worked out. I needed to just reduce this a little bit. So the uh, AMT calculation though, and this is what happens when you have a capital gain, alongside that capital gain, there's going to be an automatic calculation by CRA and a good tax professional is also going to do this. So Norman obviously is gonna step up and say, yeah, there's going to be AMT here. James should be just reminding Norman, should say, hey, uh, Norman, are you uh, letting Alan know about his AMT responsibilities just so that Alan doesn't get a shock here? So we've got a $900,000 capital gain. Unlike a normal capital gain, it's a little more complicated than this, but to simplify, there's really an 80% inclusion rate. It's actually calculated on a little more complex basis than that, but it really is ultimately an 80% inclusion rate. So there's 720,000 taxable for AMT purposes. Alan still gets to use his capital gains deduction. This four, I've rounded it off to 450,000 here. It's 440, or sorry, uh, that's, a, that's a, just a shot above what it actually is, but we'll just go with 450 just for the sake of rounding. I did that on both columns here. And uh, yeah, it'd be a 424 actually, but whatever, 424, 126. Um, and then the $40,000 AMT exemption. And that's just a, that's a normal thing that always shows up in here. It's actually because of that exemption that most people don't have to deal with AMT in a given year. And then we see that he still has $230,000 of AMT taxable income. We've taken out 490, the 450 plus the 40, still 230 left, that's AMT taxable income. There's a 15% federal AMT rate, and then there would be provincial AMT on top of that. Federal AMT only, Alan comes to 34.5. What would happen then is he would pay the $2,100 of real tax and everything in excess of real tax that's AMT would be also payable. So that's $32,400. So those two amounts added up will total up to uh, $34,500. Amounts, add them up, you get that $34,500. And Alan's going to write a check then for a total of $34,500. Out of that $34,500, $32,400 is AMT. Now, I commented that the idea here is we want Alan to stick around and use his tax savings here to contribute to the Canadian economy. The way that we do that is that Alan's AMT is recoverable against his real tax payable over the next seven years. So this is again where James and Norman are, are going to work together. Um, it might be appropriate if Alan's not working, for example, he might do RSP withdrawals to create taxable income. We wanna make sure that something happens here so that Alan can recover his $32,400.
And it is very normal to trigger this in a lifetime capital gains exemption uh, transaction, especially for farmers. You'll find this is quite often done uh, in farming transactions, and it's not always the case that the uh, client or the taxpayer is aware of it. Okay, our next trap, and this is a little more complicated than AMT, uh, is uh, cumulative net investment losses, or senile, C-N-I-L. Um, what senile refers to is over your entire investing life, all of your investments taken together. What are your investment gains minus your investment losses, or more accurately, I should say, what are your investment losses minus your investment gains? Most of us would have a senile balance of something less than zero, but if you've had more losses than gains, then you'll carry a senile balance. And just for the sake of um, sort of this theory, theoretical discussion here to make this more real, I've said Bruce, uh, in 2008, uh, Bruce borrowed, he saw what was happening in the financial crisis, and he went and got aggressive. He borrowed a half million dollars and invested that all in corporate class mutual funds in a non-registered account, which probably was a good move. I know leverage can be risky, but let's assume that Bruce has worked out well here. And he's never touched this investment. Otherwise, pretty much all of his gains have been deferred. Now, over that time, he's paid $225,000 in interest on the loan. He's had this loan outstanding for uh, 10 or 11 years. That's perfectly reasonable. And that $225,000 is carrying charges on the loan that will show up as an investment loss. Now, he has brought in $100,000 of taxable gains. This would include his dividends. If he's ever taken dividends from Trash Co., those would be gains if he's taken any sort of capital gains or dividends from these corporate class mutual funds he invested in, those would be gains. So it's probably not realistic, but let's keep it nice and low here, just $100,000 of taxable gains paid to him. So if we take into account all of, his all of his investment losses and all of his investment gains, he nets out to 125,000, losses minus gains, $125,000 of cumulative net investment loss or senile. And we're about to see the only place that senile matters. I think sometimes people overemphasize the importance of senile. It's actually one of the accounts that shows up on your CRA online profile, but almost nobody cares about senile. Bruce is about to do the only thing where we ever would care about senile. And that is Bruce is going to try to use his lifetime capital gains exemption. Well, there's a provision here that says we don't want you sort of double dipping. We don't want somebody borrowing money to buy inexpensive assets and then growing up those assets and then selling them and using the lifetime capital gains exemption, basically double dipping then on the interest carrying charges and on the lifetime capital gains exemption. So you can't have a whole bunch of investment losses and also use your lifetime capital gains exemption. So before Bruce can use the lifetime capital gains exemption, he basically has to create a zero senile balance. He would have to create $125,000 of taxable investment gains. So that might look like this. It might be $125,000 of interest income or $125,000 of dividend income or 250,000 of capital gains, which would then turn into 125,000 of taxable capital gains. If he doesn't do that, then his access to the lifetime capital gains exemption would be reduced. And this goes back to what I showed in the previous video where I uh, compared the lifetime capital gains exemption to the capital gains deduction. The 125 really comes off the capital gains deduction. So if Bruce can't show this taxable investment gain, then he would only have access to $299,000 of capital gains deduction or $600,000 roughly of lifetime capital gains exemption. However, he's got this really big capital gain, this 1.8 million, so no problem that he's well beyond having just the $250,000 of capital gains that he needs in excess of what he's trying to use the 
um, lifetime capital gains exemption for. So he's perfectly fine here. He would have the full lifetime capital gains exemption available. But if his capital gain were only, let's say, $800,000, well, now he would be restricted here because he would not have wiped out his entire um, senile balance. Okay, I know that's a little bit of a complicated beast. It's not something you'll run into all that often. Uh, it is something though that James and the accountant should be asking about. Hey Bruce, can you check your uh, online CRA account and just make sure that you don't have a senile balance? And honestly, James is gonna have a pretty good idea about this. James better know about Bruce's half million dollars that he's borrowed and all that goes along with that. Okay, uh, the next is prior use of the lifetime capital gains exemption. So in 1992, uh, Connie inherited the family cottage just for the sake of argument here. And we used to have a much broader $100,000 exemption available. Now, these rules changed early in 1990, um, sorry, 1994, February of 1994. And when these rules changed, then people were allowed to crystallize their $100,000 exemption, basically just to increase the ACB for property they own by up to $100,000, assuming it had that much value. Connie's cottage had appreciated by $40,000 in the two years since she inherited it. So she crystallized her gain increasing her ACB by $40,000. But because she used her lifetime capital gains exemption previously, now she just has $808,252 of exemption available. So you have to look for any prior use of lifetime capital gains exemption. And then something that brings us way, way back to something we talked about about 12 videos ago is the sale to a related corporation and you may recall that Bruce is married to Bonnie and that Bonnie is one of the owners at Auction Co. So if Auction Co, which is a related company to Bruce, if Auction Co is acquiring Trash Co, then Bruce would not be able to use his lifetime capital gains exemption. You don't see this too much in uh, small business transactions, but this actually comes up quite a bit in farming transactions. So it is something that you have to look for in those uh, farming transactions to make sure that there's no, um, no related company transaction happening here. Okay, lots of little tips or traps or whatever the case is there, lots of little things to watch for. Uh, lots of questions for James and Norman to go through here as they're helping these uh, uh, sellers of this business to navigate the lifetime capital gains exemption. I hope you can see that there's lots of complexity here and lots of opportunities to uh, sort of shoot ourselves in the foot as far as the lifetime capital gains exemption goes. Um, I hope you do enjoy your continued studies and join us for the next couple of videos again dealing with lifetime capital gains exemption. Thank you very much.